Welcome everyone to the very first episode of Pathways in Pediatrics. This is the official podcast of the European Academy of Pediatric Societies, EAPS. I'm really pleased you could join us. Uh, this series, well, it's going to be your shortcut really to understanding the key developments, the really cutting edge stuff happening in pediatrics and neonatology. And what we'll do is give you an exclusive sneak peek into what the leading experts have been working on, you know, the kinds of things they'll be presenting at the upcoming EAPS 2025 Congress. Just a reminder, that's happening October October 18th to 20th, 2025. It'll be live in Lisbon, Portugal, but also online. So think of this as getting a bit of a head start on those key insights. It really is an exciting prospect. And, you know, the EAPS Congress, well, since 2006, has really cemented itself as the global platform. It brings together pediatricians, researchers, healthcare professionals, basically everyone involved in child health from all over the world. Our shared goal always is to push the boundaries to advance pediatric and neonatal care. It really is a place to discover the absolute latest in research, devices, therapies, everything that's set to change how we look after our patients. Absolutely. And for this first episode, we're diving into a really critical area, one that's going to be a major focus at EAPS 2025, pediatric care, ICU, and respiratory conditions. Hmm. Okay, let's unpack this. We have some truly fascinating insights lined up from some, well, some brilliant minds in the field. First off, we're looking at insights from Dr. Rebecca Mitting. She'll be giving a really important update on some critical aspects of Pediatric Intensive Care Unit Management, the PICU. She's going to explore, first, the whole area of sedation in the PICU. It's this ongoing quest, isn't it? Where do we actually stand with evidence from, say, randomized controlled trials, and what are the latest guidelines telling us? Yeah, and it's, um, it's incredibly challenging conducting these large, robust sedation trials in the PICU setting. It's just inherently complex. You're trying to standardize care for children who are all critically ill, yes, but in so many different ways. Dr. Mitting's update, I understand, will really get into how researchers are grappling with these complexities. She'll offer insights from uh, upcoming research, too, like the pivotal sedation trial. I think the key takeaway emerging is that if we want to move the needle on evidence-based sedation, we fundamentally have to rethink how we do the research, you know, yeah. adapting to that dynamic PICU environment. Right, adapting to the chaos sometimes. Exactly. And building on that, she'll also tackle the crucial issue of identifying delirium in children. This is often harder than you might think. Her presentation will cover how well different scoring systems work, how they perform in different groups of PICU patients. And there's a really important nuance here, how delirium might look different in children with neurodevelopmental disorders. The signs can be much more subtle or, well, atypical. We'll also hear the latest on risk factors, prevention strategies, and you know how common delirium actually is in these vulnerable kids. It's vital because delirium can have these really profound long-term effects on recovery and brain development. Wow, yeah. That really highlights just how complex caring for these tiny patients is. And then Dr. Minning's update moves on to another really key area, advances in PICU care for RSV bronchiolitis. Here's where it gets really interesting. We're talking about optimizing care for infants with one of the most common respiratory viruses. It's something that can escalate so quickly. So what is optimal care for babies with RSV bronchiolitis in the PICU? What do the latest evidence-based guidelines actually recommend? This really pushes clinicians to ask, you know, what truly works? Dr. Mitting's presentation will cover the evidence for adjunctive therapies, those extra treatments, and discussions around bacterial co-infection, which is a known complication, and when antibiotics are actually appropriate in critical bronchiolitis. It's not always clear cut. A huge challenge she'll address is predicting deterioration. How can we tell which infants are going to get sicker? Which ones are at highest risk for poor outcomes? Can we get better early warnings? That prediction piece is crucial. It really is. And furthermore, she'll highlight the very latest trial evidence about the best non-invasive respiratory support. You know, is it high flow, low flow, no flow, or specific pressure settings? The data keeps evolving, and frankly, making the right call there can make a huge difference between a smooth recovery and a much longer, more complicated critical illness. And thinking about the changing RSV landscape in Europe, especially now with vaccines and new preventatives coming online, that whole discussion feels incredibly timely. It sounds like the decisions clinicians are facing are just getting more and more nuanced. Okay, shifting gears a little bit now, we'll also hear about an upcoming presentation from Ann Chang. This is on the new European Respiratory Society, the ERS guidelines on bronchiectasis in children. Bronchiectasis, it's a chronic lung condition, and we're definitely recognizing it more in children and adolescents now. And its impact, well, it's significant 
on quality of life, recurrent infections, healthcare costs. It just absolutely underlines why we need optimal standardized treatment to improve outcomes for these kids. Oh, absolutely. And the significance of these new international guidelines really can't be overstated. You have to remember, before this, we mostly just had national guidelines. So this is a big step forward globally. What's really impressive is the sheer rigor of the process they used. It wasn't quick. It involved a huge systematic review of the literature. And they meticulously applied the grade approach to assess the evidence quality. Grade, okay. Yeah, the Grading of Recommendations Assessment Development and Evaluation System. That's basically the gold standard framework. It ensures guidelines are based on the strongest possible science, making them really robust and trustworthy. That sounds incredibly thorough. It was. And the process also brought in this truly multidisciplinary team. We're talking specialists from pediatric and adult respiratory medicine, infectious disease, physio, primary care, nursing, radiology, immunology, methodologists too. Mm. And crucially, patient advocacy groups and parents were involved. That's so important. That they tackled 14 key clinical questions. We can't cover them all now, obviously. But one of the most, I think, compelling insights is their focus on the reversibility and prevention of bronchiocasis in children. It's not just about managing a chronic illness. It's about actively trying to prevent it getting worse and where possible, maybe even reversing some effects. That's such a powerful message for families. That is a massive undertaking, and having that patient involvement makes it even stronger. Okay, now let's transition to Andrew Bush's upcoming discussion. This one is on pulmonary hemorrhagic syndrome. This sounds like a truly challenging, really urgent topic for any clinician. Hemoptysis coughing up blood, it can range from, you know, tiny streaks in the sputum to massive, life-threatening bleeds. And from what we understand, the absolute top priority is always securing the airway. Because the danger, the risk of death, it's overwhelmingly from asphyxia suffocation, not from bleeding out. That's right. And the range of causes behind pulmonary hemorrhage is genuinely quite broad, surprisingly so. Dr. Bush's talk will break these down into categories. We've got rheumatological or vasculitic causes, things like anti-GBM disease or SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus. These are autoimmune conditions where the body attacks itself, sometimes including the lungs. Right. Then there are local causes, like bronchiectasis, which we just talked about, yeah. or maybe a tumor. Iatrogenic causes, meaning caused by medical intervention like trauma from suctioning, that's also possible. Cardiac issues, maybe pulmonary hypertension can be a factor. And then there's a sort of catch-all other category. That includes trauma, problems with blood clotting, coagulopathy, even factitious bleeding where symptoms might be faked, or increasingly vaping-related lung injury. That's a growing concern. Vaping, interesting. Yeah. And what's often overlooked, perhaps, is that while infections can cause it, they're actually surprisingly rare in this specific context. Okay. His presentation will also really clarify the differential diagnosis. It's so important to distinguish pulmonary bleeding from, say, bleeding from the upper airway or the gastrointestinal tract. And a critical point he'll make is that sometimes alveolar bleeding, bleeding deep in the lung tissue might not present, obviously. It might just show up as anemia without the patient actually coughing up blood. Ah. Uh. Very subtle sometimes. For acute management, Dr. Bush will outline the key strategies. Definitely perform a clotting profile, do a group, and save in case a blood transfusion is needed. Medical treatments could involve vasoconstrictors like ice-cold saline or adrenaline to narrow blood vessels, or using agents like tranexamic aphid to help with clotting. And then there are bronchoscopic options using a scope like placing a bronchial blocker to isolate the bleeding area, or even selectively intubating one lung. And, of course, he'll stress how vital close collaboration with pediatric rheumatology is, especially if you suspect one of those vasculitis syndromes. That's incredibly detailed and vital information for anyone working in intensive care. Managing pulmonary hemorrhage clearly demands quick thinking and a very precise, multi-pronged approach. Okay, but let's shift gears again now. Let's look at areas where our diagnostic tools are getting sharper, really promising some profound changes in how we approach basic respiratory care. Danielle DeLuca is going to be diving deep into personalized surfactant use and also quantitative lung ultrasound. First up, he'll discuss personalized surfactant uses. This is for RDS, respiratory distress syndrome, and IDGs, neonatal acute respiratory distress syndrome. Now, historically, surfactant administration, well, it's often been a bit simplified, hasn't it? Mainly just looking at the patient's FiO2, the oxygen level they need. And while that might have helped spread its use for RDS and premature babies, it might also be partly why it hasn't been quite as useful in ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. In other situations, it's been maybe a bit of a blunt instrument. Exactly. And that raises the big question. How do we get beyond that simplification? 
how do we truly tailor the therapy? Dr. DeLuca's presentation will explain that we now have new tools, accurate tools, surprisingly easy to use tools, actually. These tools let us understand a patient's specific pathophysiology much better, how the disease is uniquely affecting their body. We can now detect surfactant injury more precisely and, crucially, guide surfactant administration much more effectively. He'll cover all this in light of the very latest data for both RDS and ARDS in neonates and older children. It really highlights this exciting move towards true precision medicine in this field. The key insight, moving from that one-size-fits-all idea to highly individualized treatment driven by precise lung diagnostics. That really does sound like a game changer, tailoring therapy like that, especially for these incredibly vulnerable patients. Okay, and then the final exciting topic from Danielle DeLuca, quantitative lung ultrasound. What's so fascinating here is how a diagnostic tool we've been using for a while is just becoming even more powerful. We've seen lung ultrasound, LUS, spread significantly through NICUs and PICUs over the last decade or so. It's become a real go-to tool for many clinicians. Indeed it has, and the technique officially became quantitative when validated scores were introduced. These scores are designed specifically to assess lung aeration. That means basically measuring how much of the lung volume is actually available for gas exchange to happen efficiently. Oh, okay. Measuring it. It's exactly. Moving from just looking qualitatively to getting precise, measurable scores. It's a huge step forward. There's now a really wide body of literature supporting quantitative LUS. And this has spurred the creation of robust, multidisciplinary guidelines for critically ill adults, children, and neonates in ICUs. Dr. DeLuca's presentation will cover the basics of quantitative LUS and these recently issued guidelines. It'll provide really essential insights for clinicians wanting to leverage this technology for better patient management. It's all about getting more actionable data from every scan you do. Wow. What an incredible range of topics we've managed to touch on in this very first episode of Pathways in Pediatrics, from those critical updates on sedation and delorium in the ICU to the new international guidelines for bronchiectasis, the complex management of pulmonary bleeding, all the way to these groundbreaking advances in personalized surfactant and quantitative lung ultrasound. These are all areas that are clearly evolving fast, really pushing the boundaries of what we can achieve in pediatric and neonatal care. It's quite a journey just in this one deep dive. Mm -hmm. And remember, this is just a taste of what's coming at EAPS 2025. Absolutely. The Congress really is where global experts come together, share the latest research, the new devices, the therapies. It's where the future of pediatrics gets shaped. Well, that brings us to the end of our very first deep dive for Pathways in Pediatrics. We really hope this gave you some valuable insights, a useful shortcut. Maybe sparked a few new questions for you, too. We hope so. And we're definitely looking forward to exploring more key pediatric topics in future episodes. Us, too. And we really genuinely encourage you to join us in Lisbon for EAPS 2025 or join online if you can't make it in person, October 18th to 20th. Imagine the connections, the learning. Yeah. It really is an invaluable experience. It truly is. Okay, thank you so much for joining us on this deep dive. Thanks, everyone. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning, and definitely keep asking those important questions. Bye for now.